Hello, this is Kao Kandek with Mokana, and thanks for joining our webinar today. Uh, today we're with Real-Time Innovations, RTI, to discuss how to overcome obstacles of industrial IoT system security. It's a mouthful, but this will be fun. Today we have Tim McAllister, our Director of Business Development at Mokana, and Nahir Patel, Product Manager at RTI. Welcome, guys. Hey, thank you. All right, well, thanks for joining us. Um, overcoming the obstacles of uh, IIoT and industrial IoT uh, systems, um, certainly critical and important. So first let's talk about industrial IoT and, uh, and what it is and what companies are doing with industrial uh, IoT today. You hear any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so RTI comes from a, a very particular perspective uh, with uh, consideration to industrial IoT. We are a, a connectivity company by nature, uh, founded based on uh, the open standard data distribution services. So we look at connecting all these distributed and disparate systems so that they can now act more intelligently at uh, various levels. And you can, you can call them what you will, edge, fog, cloud, uh, but in the end it'll all be uh, interconnected to, to act more intelligently on, on our behalf. Right. And I, I mean, when you think of robotics in, um, uh, in industrial systems or autonomous systems, yeah. um, a lot of that requires absolute real-time uh, connectivity. Yeah. So, you know, there's, and there are different layers to this as well. So there's robotics operating at microsecond, millisecond, uh, uh, analytics systems running at maybe you know, Hertz and, and business systems that have kind of a, a human real-time, we say real-time, but it's like right. when, I, when I push a button, I want the, the business data, right? And that's all informed by those industrial systems, those autonomous systems right. that, that have to be built. I'll tell you, I know, uh, Tim, you were recently at Hanover Messe, uh, the, one of the largest industrial shows, and there was certainly a lot of robotics and real-time uh, systems there. Uh, tell, tell me something interesting that, that you saw there that, that demonstrated. So Hanover Messe, the industrial shows in the globe, right, ha happens to be in Hanover, Germany. But uh, so one, of the, one of the most interesting uh, uh, demonstrations I saw, Kao, was you being able to play ping pong. <laughs> Omron uh, ping pong spider yeah. robot. It was this huge at one end of the table, spider-like robot with a ping-pong paddle affixed to an appendage, and it was quite quite good at keeping up. Talk about real time. It was yeah. good. It wasn't was fast enough. It was oh, funny. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so uh, okay, security. Um, all of the connectivity in industrial IoT can be very concerning to people, right? We're hearing uh, stories of attacks, uh, other nation states, um, uh, uh, hackers in critical infrastructure. Um, Tim, tell me a little bit about why, why it's so uh, challenging to secure these uh, systems, connected systems. So, so when you look at industrial systems, these are systems that were effectively generally closed networks. They were uh, defined with um, specialized industrial protocols that weren't uh, TCP IP based. Um, there really wasn't this drive or perception that there was any need for security or accounting for security. And um, just in general, we've seen a number of very uh, uh, you know, high visibility attacks of these industrial control systems. Stuxnet, uh, Hatman, Trisys, you know, we just saw another instance of that in the last couple of months pop up, pop, pop up and be disclosures made about that. But generally speaking, these have a number of attack surface areas uh, that, that jump uh, traditional IT, OT related defenses for network segmentation and firewalling. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, they attack the humans, the human factor, and they, they ride that human, that vendor, into the air-gapped, protect, quote, protected, unquote, uh, portion of that network. 
and and literally um, once they get to that level below the firewall into what's viewed as a protected air gap network, there's nothing to stop those attackers from taking over that whole control plane. And there's another thing that doesn't come up, and I won't get into this because this is a topic for another webinar, but, but there's a whole different priority of attack and the impacts, the business impacts, when you talk about accessing these industrial control networks and the potential for loss of life, the safety critical nature of these attacks and what they're, uh, what they're targeting is very different than losing, you know, X number of hundreds of millions of social security numbers for right. consumers, right. right? It's a very, if planes start falling out of the sky because they've attacked the engine control system for the, you know, how we achieve that great fuel economy on all planes, it's going to be a really long year, right, for all of us. So we have a problem, right? On the one hand, you have businesses that are trying to connect more and more of their critical systems um, in order to achieve business outcomes, uh, whether it's reducing uh, costs uh, or improving uh, uptime of their systems or, or taking advantage of data that they can pump into an AI system. Um, at the same time, through more contact connection, you've got these, these security issues. Um, Kim, you talked a little bit about, uh, about these challenges, but I, I want to start jumping into um, really what RTI and Mokana are doing together, because I do think it's ex exciting. Yeah. Um, so let's start off with Nahir. Tell us a bit about uh, RTI. Yeah. Um, so I think the best way to really talk about RTI is to talk about our customers and the use cases that we're, we're in. So. Um, we, we, you know, this is this has got a lot going on, and you know, RTI is involved in a number of consortia trying to drive, you know, standards around connectivity and security uh, in all these mission critical systems that that you see here, um, from aviation and avionics to uh, self driving vehicles to healthcare and and critical energy infrastructure. Uh, but uh, to maybe focus it a little bit in, in looking at um, kind of the different industries uh, separately, it, we're really driving uh, these industries towards autonomy. All right, so uh, I think the, the most near term that uh, folks are really, really excited about are self-driving cars, for example. But um, if we think about connected healthcare and the level of intelligence we can provide to a clinical environment, um, it, it saves lives. Uh, it, you know, and I'll talk. I can talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But um, this is this is the direction RTI is going. This is what RTI helps helps uh, uh, these industries achieve and realize. Okay. So typically, we have this uh, conversation with with a lot of folks who are are you know understand IoT as some device connected to to the cloud, and, and that's not going away, and we know that, but there's this other type of IoT, which is this industrial IoT, um, where we're, we're providing a level of intelligence at the edge, right? So we talked about the edge, and, and we'll, we'll talk more about it and continue talking about it for, for a long time, but uh, we're, we're really talking about connecting devices so that they can now work together and provide this extra layer of, of information, extra level of intelligence. To, uh, to make decisions in, again, right, the real time we're talking about is you know, microsecond, millisecond, it's, it's immediate, um, so that it's faster to be able to respond, so that humans can be, can be involved. Um, but RTI really focuses on those, those systems, those distributed systems that we, we saw in the previous uh, set of slides. Right. Yeah, so, so what I'm seeing is a lot of the systems that we have today are built in more of a hierarchical architecture. Yeah, right. yeah, and there's, there was, you know, there was a, a, a clear purpose for that. There was, there was uh, a, a huge drive behind gathering data and, and, and cloud computing, and there's, there's this idea of, okay, well, you know, there's a lot of computing in, in these huge data centers. What about pushing some of that? that computing down to the edge so it, these decisions can be made 
at a much faster rate. And in the autonomous vehicle example, if you're in a self-driving car, you're not going to wait for that car to talk to a cloud and then come back with a decision whether you need to turn right or turn left to avoid a pedestrian in the crosswalk. Sure. Right? So sure. Or, or even on a factory floor, on a collaborative yeah. robot needing to actually sense things right. in real time and make it decision. So, yeah, if you think about how, how quickly you need to produce uh, some products in, in a factory floor, you're not going to, again, right, go to a cloud to make a decision about how that product should be made. That should be, should be done at, the, at that level where the robots are talking to themselves. Right. I mean, I can see it in things like healthcare, in an OR, or, mm -hmm. or I mean, all of the different things in a, in a hospital, uh, in an airplane, um, yeah. the, the, you know, the, the required hundreds of thousands of components that are on there. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, interesting. Yeah, interesting. so, well, speaking of healthcare, I can, yep. you know, if I, if I jump in, and this is where we start to see, again, right, the connectivity, the, the industrial IoT aspect, and, and where the intelligence uh, fits in. Uh, so this is, this is a, a, an adaptation of an architecture or a, a concept uh, created by the Industrial Internet Consortium, of, of which both Mokana and, and RTI participate heavily, uh, called the Layered Data Bus. Uh, the idea is that there's levels of communication happening at, at different levels. Uh, at the lowest level, you might have uh, an integrated clinical environment. This is, you know, patient room, an operating room, or recovery room. Uh, but there are all these devices, and it, you know, and, and God forbid anyone ever has to be in one of these rooms. But if you are, you see that there's 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 these alarms coming off of all these oh, different constantly. all these different <laughs> devices and you have no idea and if and you know, if you're there caring for a loved one you're freaking out you don't know you what's are. going on uh, you're waiting for a nurse to come by but they have hundreds of these alarms that they have to manage so they get what we what's called alarm fatigue oh, yeah. so they can't keep up with all of that and so by connecting these devices building in some intelligence the nurse is now able to to provide the care that he or she's uh, really capable of doing, and that's at a, this higher level, and, and based on in information and contextual information that that allows her to take action. Well, we go a level up, right? I mean, there's there's now coordinating multiple rooms, each having their own, you know, quote unquote network. They're all connected over the real, like the same network, but like kind of a localized domain, uh, if you will. Yeah, from the OR up to the the hospital wing. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and then you again you go a level up and now you, I mean if you're you know looking at just a hospital or multiple hospitals uh, from a business perspective how do you you know optimize the way you're running your hospital yep. how do we deliver better patient care yep. uh, so this is this is all the the connectivity aspect but now as we build out that connectivity if you're connecting all these devices in a patient room and that's somehow in one form or another connected to a business center you now have that security problem, that challenge that you sure. have to, to solve. So now you have to secure all those devices and make sure that they, one, can't be compromised to harm the patient, but, you know, two, can't be compromised to harm the business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. I, I mean, I think we've all been in situations like that where, where you're in the uh, hospital room and there's just an alarm going mm -hmm. off every few minutes or, or more often. Yeah. 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 Um, so if I can, I'll, I'll dig in a little deeper and, and show, start to show a little bit where, um, you know, DDS security, which is a, an extension of the, the data distribution services standard, comes in. And this is, this is getting more towards uh, the integration that uh, RTI and Mokana have, have put together. Um, we've taken a, a, an open source uh, uh, program or simulation called OpenICE. Uh, this is an integrated clinical environment. We've demonstrated that we can... Uh, integrate both, uh, you know, Connect DDS, which is RTI's uh, data distribution services implementation, and Mokana's security, uh, we talked about uh, trust point and trust center, uh, to provide access control at the device level, uh, but we can also then encrypt and authenticate those messages uh, thanks to the, the cryptography that uh, Mokana provides. Uh, so now you can define in, in this particular scenario if you know, that pulse oximeter should only be writing status data or should, be, should it be receiving some data and what data that is. Uh, and so, so with, with, uh, with TrustPoint, we get to the extra, the hardware-based uh, security, and with Trust Center, we get the certificate and PKI management so that, and by the way, that's another challenge we see with customers is, is managing certificates and managing PKI. 
uh, when they get started with architecting a DDS-based system. And so this is something that will help get them up and running and get them, right. get them started. Yeah, no, absolutely. We see that. I mean, we, we talk with customers all the time uh, in medical, in um, on the aerospace side, and in industrial. You know, how do you know that you can trust the data? You've invested all of this money in AI systems um, and uh, communication systems, but how do you know you can trust the data if you can't even trust the device, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, great. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so now let's bridge over to security. Uh, um, Tim, tell us a little bit about Mokana and um, uh, your thoughts on securing these environments. Yeah, thanks, Gail. So uh, Mokana, uh, you might not have heard of before, but uh, we're one of the leading um, IoT security companies in the world. Uh, we got our start back in 2002 protecting U.S. intelligence and Defense Department weapons programs and special access programs, and then transition that into the commercial sector, all of that cryptographic uh, made in the U.S. experience, and applied it to today we protect over 200 of the top tier global OEMs. Some of the logos you see here, ABB, Siemens, Schneider, a uh, number of carriers, Verizon, AT&T, and a lot of the top networking companies in, in the globe, and all of them are relying upon uh, Mokana's security solutions to protect their products, right? So today we're protecting at least 100 million devices um, and we're recognized by a number of the uh, industry analysis companies like Frost and Sullivan for being a uh, recognized leader in the IoT security space. So let me just spend a little bit of time talking about the challenge, some of the initial challenges with security for industrial systems, right? OT systems, operational technology systems. So the hackers are bypassing the traditional defenses, right? So you have IT security that's been bent to uh, protect these OT environments, uh, you know, traditional firewalls, a uh, little bit more focused on the OT, these unidirectional data diode gateways, uh, IPS and IDS systems, as well as the IT-focused threat detection tweaked to apply for the, these OT environments and protocols, right? So um, they're not addressing the challenge of device security of this newly connected device that's communicating and passing all this data back up to these um, connected systems. And, and the basic um, fundamental challenges associated with securing these devices. Then you look at OT security, much of what you see is really network segmentation, either based on firewalls or, or some kind of uh, switching or routing architectures. And then that's the generation for air gap, although there's challenges with air gap networks because there's such a huge business benefit by connecting, even if it's just monitoring, right. quote, mo I hear this, monitoring only, right. and so then you don't have a security challenge, it's in that environment. So, so let's talk about that. So yeah. air gaps, we hear about this all the time. Okay, the, you know, my, my network is air gapped or it's a private network, it's not connected to the internet. Yeah. I don't need to worry about security. Uh, wh how, how, do, how do hackers get around this concept of a, a separately segmented network or an air gap? So it's literally through uh, humans, right? They target, I mean, we hear, I mean, it's almost to the point where we're ignoring it. Yeah. There's just so much of the spear phishing. It's targeted 
email delivery with malware. They know exactly who the person is. They know they're an HVAC vendor. They know they're, uh, you know, some kind of supply in the supply chain of a critical infrastructure facility, and they infect their laptop. They get on the, the tools that they use to intersect and monitor and add, uh, make service repair yeah. to these critical infrastructure facilities. So it isn't without some some level of effort and yeah. sophistication, but that's how they're bypassing these air gaps in these critical industrial networks. Yeah, yeah, and so we, we refer to it uh, commonly as like insider threats, right? It's, it, either wittingly yeah. or unwittingly, yep. um, someone may may want to, to to do something within, and they may have the privileges to do so. Um, and, and so the, that's and, where... And that privilege just might be to walk in the door right, and to plug their laptop or USB key and mm -hmm. to affect an update. Sure. <laughs> right? right? Right. And who, who would think about it, right? Oh, I'm just updating the thermostat system or an HVAC right. system. Yeah, it's totally unrelated. And the malware that gets put on there, uh, I mean, effectively it gets on a network that's unprotected. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. Great. So, I mean, just, uh, just looking at, at uh, some of the vulner vulnerabilities and weaknesses. So the unsecured keys, you hear a lot about passwords. Um, uh, lack of implementation of cryptographic service, uh, services, particularly with regard to uh, industrial protocols, um, weak authentication, um, and then open source security. There's a ton of, and I, we won't get into this, we have other webinars that cover this that you can pick up on our, our website resources, but the OpenSSL has numerous and ongoing vulnerabilities and they're, um, these products that integrate OpenSSL as a security solution and stack are in these uh, environments that don't lend themselves well to updates, to the traditional IT focused patch management. They cannot and will not and do not put up with downtime, right, unless something truly fundamentally breaks. So there's no patch Tuesday in these industrial environments. Right. It just doesn't, that mindset doesn't translate and is not it's uh, you know fantasy thinking frankly so yeah one one minute of downtime that's it could be millions millions of dollars so it's, or the whole line reset right yeah right so here, here's some uh, uh, challenges with the supply chain and vulnerabilities that exist in both the devices and the processes so some of this is related directly to the ecosystem and the available solutions, right? So there's, it starts with the hardware, the chips, right, that are uh, designed in to the products. And the chips are, are today getting stamped with some form of credential. It could be a certificate, uh, could be some kind of key, hopefully it's not a password, right? And then that is basically the default credential that's incorporated and integrated into a, a kind of a, a product. Um, then there is the actual process for onboarding and provisioning this new, new product, right? And there's a whole host of security challenges, but it's not just security challenges. It has to do with the scale of how do you orchestrate, automate, and manage and leverage the fact that you, you're adding a new piece of equipment and increasing the efficiencies, your operational efficiencies, so that you get significant business value by this taking this next gen, adding this next gen product into these networks, right? So that, you know, is not taken lightly. So there's a number of issues with weak keys, manual keys, uh, uh, and then you move into the fielding where there is, from, from what we hear from our customers, an entirely manual process when it comes to onboarding devices. So this manual process is effectively registering a unique ID in a database. And so you need to basically, either the database has the unique IDs that get allocated to the device that's being turned on and fielded, mm -hmm. or the unique ID in the device needs to be registered into the centralized database for, for that system. So that process is wrought with security challenges and then it's very manual. So if it took you a truck roll, a service truck roll, you know, 40 minutes at a service technician's time, each of these 
devices being implemented and installed is is costing a business hundreds of dollars. I mean, what I take from this is um, uh, it's complex, <laughs> right? Yeah. You're developing a medical device or oh, yeah. a uh, or a control system to protect a a turbine in a power plant or a compressor in a refinery, yeah. and as a yeah. manufacturer of that system, you've got to think through all of this. I mean, come on. That's, yeah. that's challenging, right, to be able to coordinate with the silicon vendor all the way through. And then to think that even if you do that from a product perspective, you may be compromised by the field tech. Yeah, yeah. the, the <laughs> fundamental you're, process because that you're you, relying because on. Because you've just given them a spreadsheet of yeah. all the private keys to go and install and, right. you know, bring yeah. up equipment, right? Yep. Um, it it, it um, uh, um, seems like there are a lot of problems. So tell us a little bit about the specific Makana solution. Yeah, so so the Makana solution, so there's two components to it. And, and what we've done is focused on protecting the device, the application that runs on that device, the data being generated by, by that device, and the communications back up into the data center or cloud, right? So it starts with the device. And we have Mokana's trust point software solution, so we're software solution, we license software on a uh, term or subscription basis, and for the on-device security, it's literally installed or added to the device to implement the, the capabilities that, that we'll um, outline. So it starts with protecting the device by adding the Mokana security. So, and software. who does that typically? So typically the OEMs do that. Okay, okay. Right? And, uh, you know, so they integrate it into their their products. There is some of the latest trust point offerings are capable of being added to, you know, after the fact, later stage in the uh, ecosystem. So we have some solutions for Brownfield as well. But uh, then the other side of this is the services side, which is the, so now you have con a control plane and management plane in the device itself what can you do with it? And the, and the answer is there's a ton of business benefit you can get by having a, a system to manage the device security lifecycle. You can set up automation for, uh, you know, strong security and automation of certificates and credentials, uh, which is a huge challenge as soon as you implement, you know, what uh, TLS or, you know, SSL TLS for the, the data communications layer. And if it's mutual authentication, how are you managing the certificates on this end sure. remotely installed the fielded device? It's seriously challenging. And then also the updates, right? There's not, from, from what we've talked with our customers, there's a significant value in having a services infrastructure that makes it so easy to log into a portal, upload their software component that goes into this um, firmware or configuration update and have that packet signed, packaged in an encrypted PKS7 envelope and then delivered securely, not just relying on maybe there's an encrypted path between the, the cloud and the connected device, you know, where you rely on some kind of version of AES, but literally if you have, we have customers in environments where they cannot send because of their air gap network, they can't send updates over the air. Right. They literally have to hand carry them on a technician's laptop. And in that case, if it's not encrypted, you have no security as soon as it's as soon as that package, that update package has been generated and, and prepared. So we've got a couple questions here. I'm going to take these while we're on this slide. So if an OEM takes Makana Trust Point uh, and installs it uh, in, on their device in their in their uh, uh, application. Uh, how do they validate that it's been installed correctly? So there are a, a number of uh, self-tests. Uh, there's a significant amount of documentation that's provided with the Mokana software solution. And there's also uh, partners that actually provide security vulnerability assessments mm -hmm. that we work with. So, and we provide sample code that basically gives all of our OEM customers uh, basically the roadmap for implementing proper security on this device. Because it is challenging, it is it complex, is. Yeah. and that's the benefit of the Mokana solution is you have this 
tight integration between the device security and the orchestration and control and management plane. Yeah, and we've seen customers, they struggle with obviously implementing complex cryptography uh, yeah. and doing it securely. But, you know, with a, a bit of hand-holding in the beginning, uh, we were working with one customer. Uh, they were up in about three days coding and building, uh, and we've seen other customers within weeks get to production ready uh, yeah. with security. Um, okay, and then um, uh, uh, what about retrofitting? So if an OEM doesn't add that code and the devices are already in the field, what can you do? What are some of the, what we call that brownfield legacy devices? That's a, there's a ton of that. What are some of the things? Yeah, so, so Mokana, um, maybe I should jump to the next slide. Sure. So Mokana has a number of capabilities and components. So the lower half in green, um, so by having this end-to-end -end system, we're affecting the device protection, that cyber protection. Uh, we're able to leverage uh, automation with regard to provisioning updates and the management and orchestration of those. So if you look to the, to, to talk to the brownfield point, so the, the lighter green shade on the lower left corner of that circle, of that pie, uh, the trust point clients uh, basically interface directly with the trust center services, and those are agent technologies that can be added to devices at a later stage, uh, including brownfield devices. So it doesn't have to be compiled and integrated in with the firmware. It's a loadable kernel module that can uh, interoperate and be um, added after the fact. So that's one idea. Another idea, we have other customers that are actually, um, one of our, uh, I mean, this is public information, GE Power. They actually did a brownfield retrofit to implement DMP3 security, secure authorization uh, for their uh, D20 R RTUs. Oh. Right, so they actually packaged up a new firmware load that had security implementation and went out to their customers and had that be an option where they could update the, you know, get secure DMP3 um, pro protocol with a brownfield product. So th that's some ideas on, on the brownfield, mm -hmm. how to address the brownfield. Yeah, fields. yeah. I, I mean, and, and it's, a, it's a great question because 85% of these connected devices are legacy devices yeah. in the field. Yeah. Right, and that means they've been around for 10 plus years. Really yeah. old stuff. Okay, um, so uh, let's jump into what, uh, w how this thing works together. And here, tell us about how this fits together. Yeah, so you're talking about uh, provisioning of certificates and certificates and keys for, for these systems. And just a quick point on that is, you know, these DDS-based systems could be tens, hundreds, or, or more, uh, thousands of, of these different DDS participants. So. Yeah. Um, being able to provision those with something like Trust Center um, makes uh, the, the lives of our customers a lot easier. Um, another thing, so that, that makes, uh, makes their lives and, and, well, really our lives here at RTI easier is um, the, the integration with, uh, with Trust Point, right? So yep. um, for those who are a little bit familiar with uh, Connects DDS Secure, our uh, security-based uh, DDS implementation, it's really a set of security plugins uh, into the core uh, Connect DDS libraries. So with this pluggable technology, we can, um, we can swap in different cryptography, and Mokana has um, their solution with an OpenSSL shim layer, OpenSSL connector, I believe. Yeah, OpenSSL connector. Uh, that actually worked pretty seamlessly with, with the RTI security plugin. So, um, so what we see here is, is your, your device, uh, typical platform, you'll have hardware, your operating system, and then DDS is running in that application space. Um, but with the, um, with the Mokana plugin, the Mokana cryptography, uh, uh, we can actually uh, extend the plugins that RTI provides. So we provide uh, cryptography, authentication, access control, logging, and, and more recently in our Connect 6 launch, we. Uh, provide data tagging, uh, but in that cr cryptography plugin, we it in itself has a plugin for the crypt, uh, for the crypto engine, and that's where Mokana fits in very seamlessly. Uh, and so now, instead of you know 
ArcGI making you know, open SSL calls to an open SSL engine, we're making open SSL calls into a commercially supported Mulcana crypto engine that's generating and, and, and managing keys in a TPM, right? Yep. So from a customer perspective, this is actually, this is actually transparent. From an RTI customer yep. perspective, this is transparent. You would write your DDS application and even the, uh, the, the DDS security aspect is, is mostly transparent from a development perspective, but um, I can get Yeah, hey, quick question. You mentioned TPM. Um, tell me about that, uh, what a TPM does in, in this type of architecture. So in this, in this architecture, trusted platform module is a, a common uh, term for uh, a hardware-based key store or key generation. So in, this, uh, in that previous uh, uh, demo example that, uh, that I showed with the uh, open ICE, um, it's generating the keys within the TPM where it is protected from, uh, from access. So these private keys cannot be retrieved by anybody who may get physical access to the device. And, but, but RTIs um, or Connect DDS can access those plugins through Mokana and then apply that to uh, either encrypt, um, authenticate, provide access control for uh, data communications between DDS participants. Well, I, I mean, that makes, this makes it seem pretty simple, right? I mean, thinking about how if you're developing a product, yeah. if you have all of the software for delivering high-speed connectivity and a way to secure it, and it's already been pre-tested and integrated. I mean, I've seen the demo. You mm -hmm. yep. Here has a whole suitcase full <laughs> of, of devices, and yep. it shows how, how easy it is to actually do this um, uh, and demonstrate uh, a secure platform. Um, but that, must, that makes it easy. Yeah, and so, you know, we talk about challenges that, are, that our customers, whether it's RTI or Mokana's customers face. Anyone with security challenges one of the obstacles is getting that integration. So, you know, my, my recommendation to anyone on call is demand that your suppliers are talking to each other and demand that they, they integrate and, and, and give them your requirements so that they can do it right. Uh, so yep. tell, tell us what to do. <laughs> um, so I was going to, I think, jump into um, how the development might look. Uh, if that's all right, I can, sure. I can go there. Oh, oh yeah. One last point on, on Mokana Trust Center, right? So we're managing the certificates through through Trust Center. And the updates. And the updates. Yep. So this is um, a, a DDS kind of RTI-based development model. Um, really, with, with DDS, there's a lot of um, uh, XML-based configuration, file-based configuration. Uh, we focus around the data, so defining the data model, what are the data types that flow through your system, to whom they go, and, and so forth. Um, your, pick your favorite programming language. You know, a lot of folks like modern C++, some are, you know, C-sharp fans. Uh, it, we're agnostic to that, right? It's not, um, it's not a prerequisite for, for DDS. Uh, and then, of course, you need to know what, what your platform looks like. Um, but as we go forward, uh, we, we, we feed all that information into what we call RTI DDS Gen is, is just a, a, a tool, a utility to help generate uh, support data, some configurations and some uh, application support files, uh, and your, some build infrastructure for your application. Uh, we take the RTI Connect DDS libraries and we, we bundle those and mush them all together with your, your tool chain of choice and the application code that you've written. So this is, this is the key here, right, is you're writing application code that is based on your core competency, your core values, your core business, and not worrying about the underlying connectivity. And then in a minute we're going to see where uh, Mokana comes into this, but um, we, we can shape the, uh, the connectivity, the data flows, using a quality of service, and that's similar to how you would configure security. Um, oh, I think uh, I missed that part here. Sorry, can I back up? Yep. Uh, okay. Bear with me a minute. So, so while you're, I, um, I want to ask um, Tim. So, we've got these RTI DDS libraries. Uh, we have these different. Um, uh, 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 
applications and development tools, um, uh, how, how does, um, uh, how, how do developers actually consume Mokana Trust Point? How do they um, have it be present here and get it in the system? So in this case, basically it's uh, software libraries that have been predefined and pre-integrated with the DDS uh, libraries that you see pictured here. So you have a uh, uh, the source code. It's the it. source code yeah. for the uh, TrustPoint core solution, and then uh, uh, TrustPoint clients interoperate with the uh, Trust Center orchestration system, and that is with uh, binaries. Okay, software binaries that run as loadable uh, services agents. Yeah, yeah. And so I got I got super excited about this and, and skipped over you guys there, but. With the where where you see the DDS libraries, that's that's really effectively where the Mokana libraries yep. would reside, and and the DDS libraries will make a call that OpenSSL call into the Mokana crypto engine, and that that trust point, and that's where all the magic happens. That you know is abstracted, really abstracted away from from folks at RTI. Right. It's abstracted away from from developers, uh, so our common customers. Um, to, to take advantage of, of yeah. TrustPoint and, and hardware-based key store. So you've got the Mokana code, you've got the DDS code, right. you've got the customer's application, yes. you've got it all defined, you've got uh, in the tool chain, and yeah. then you can compile all of that into your yeah. firmware or application that you're pushing into your device. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. That is that is pretty uh, pretty simple. Yeah, and I mean the business value of having these pre-integrated solutions. I mean, some of our customers were because because one of the uh, you know leveraging uh, TPMs, trusted platform modules, was one of the uh, security challenges with a number of our customers in their implementation, and they had been spend spent months trying to figure it out, getting it to interface with their application lo level layer, and um, uh, and then like uh, you were mentioning, Kao, it literally took them uh, less than uh, two weeks yeah. Yeah. to have it implemented and right. re ready to go once they had access to the Mokana solution. Right. Yep. Uh, so we have a couple of questions here in the last five minutes here. So um, uh, this was in reference to, I think, Mokana on a couple of slides uh, ago. Have there been issues with installation? And then who, who is liable? Um, uh, the... Um, uh, Tim, can you talk a, a little bit about uh, about that? So uh, there have been historically no CVEs uh, ever leveled against Mokana, right? And those are the uh, NIST security vulnerability assessments made. So uh, as far as that goes, with re regard to installation, having the sample code we find our customers have the path, kind of the roadmap forward for development to properly implement uh, the and leverage the Mokana security stack on their in their solution in their product. Um, and as far as who's liable, that's uh, you know an ongoing question that uh, is getting uh, sorted out at the marketplace, right? I mean, yeah. GDPR has been a game changer when it comes to the uh, liability and 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 looks like liabilities transitioning downstream from just the operator that had this confidentiality or data breach down into the supply chain. So it's a in, in, very interesting topic that we won't be able to cover. <laughs> yeah, that's a, another, another good one. Too. <laughs> Two or three rep <laughs> yeah, there, exactly. Cover that in five minutes. Um, uh, and... Um, um, the uh, you know I, th I think when we we think about okay how do we do this right you can actually see a path with RTI and Mokana as a, a an OEM or an industrial operator you should have a clear path to absolutely being able to secure uh, real time communications um, and the device and application uh, itself um, so um, uh, let's see. It, uh, here, any parting thoughts? Uh, yeah, um, you know, as as these new uh, industrial Internet of Things architectures are being designed, developed, implemented, uh, 
you know, keep security in mind. Um, I, the reality is a lot of folks are going to still apply security later on, but, but keep it in mind and, and work with your suppliers to, to you know, get ahead of, of the upcoming challenges with regards to development and, and deployment of, of your system. And Tim, uh, anything from uh, from you? Uh, so, um, yeah, with with our customers, there's a couple of things. So, if there's uh, cybersecurity compliance, there's a there's an emerging set of requirements coming down the path. Both RTI and Mokana and a lot of other um, industrially focused. Um, uh, Companies are uh, joined uh, together at the Industrial Internet Consortium, and uh, so there's a uh, best practices for endpoint security document that's available and publicly accessible on Mokana's website or the IIC's uh, website directly. So we see compliance being a big driver. Uh, but also, when you're running your, uh, developing your POC, if you can actually figure out how to add security for that POC and have that whole product production roadmap mapped out as opposed to right now we see POCs being launched and they don't account for security. This is an easy way to be able to plug in and gain access and have that roadmap with, for production with security accounted for. And we see that as a big um, plus. Great. And uh, I know there are going to be companies that want to test this out and see it running for themselves. Yeah. So. Um, uh, what can people do to, to get their hands on this? And uh, so, yeah, definitely reach out, uh, reach out to McConnell, reach out to RTI. Um, we, we, like you said, we have this demo in a in a briefcase. It gets some eyes at the airport, but we, we typically get through. <laughs> uh, and we can we can bring it on we can bring it on site and, and show you. Um, and we can we can dig in deep and, and look at how we're protecting the uh, the yeah. data or uh, just demonstrate how McConnell and, and RTI Connects work together pretty seamlessly. That's great. Well, thank you, guys. This has been great. And uh, for those of you who have joined our webinar, uh, uh, thank you for joining us. And please do reach out to uh, us. And um, thanks for joining us.